Hi there and thanks for joining me. Today we're going to wrap up this month's training on estimating structural steel, finishing with writing a proposal. Now how your company presents and offers your price and services has important and legal ramifications. And today we're going to cover what those are and how to write a quote. So stay tuned. Now the first and most important thing for you to know about your proposal is that it is a legal document and contract. And you heard me right, until or unless you replace or supersede it with an executed subcontract agreement, your proposal is the controlling document. Which is why it's so important that it contain your price, scope of work, and terms and conditions. These three give your employer all the information they need to know to decide whether or not to hire you on the project. And they have no right to change any of that unless you agree to it. And that is the act of negotiation. Now the precedence of your proposal is both described and supported within California Public Contracting Code Section 4107. Additionally, it was upheld by a California appellate court in a case that's known as Flintco Pacific Incorporated versus TEC Management Consultants Incorporated. But we're gonna go down the rabbit trail of contracts and contract law in July. So be sure to become a member and stick around for that. I'm gonna spend the rest of our time today looking at how your proposal should be constructed and what that should look like for you. Now as I just mentioned, there are three items that should be present in every single proposal. And those are price, scope of work, and terms and conditions. And they should be presented in that order. This is the generally accepted progression of every contract document. And if we're being honest, it puts things in order of what people are most interested in seeing. And I'm going to go through each one of those with you today, but in reverse order. So starting with terms and conditions. Unlike the other two sections, which are exclusively project specific, your terms and conditions are going to be more company specific and that they're going to outline how your company prefers to do business. And that's going to change from one to the other. For that reason, I can't give any concrete examples of what your terms and conditions will look like, but I'll give you a couple of suggestions of things to consider to have included in there. And the first one I'll bring up is the schedule. Now we have talked about schedule a lot this month already, and that's because the schedule has very significant and important impacts on your project and profitability. For that reason, you might want to consider requiring that your company be a participant in developing the project schedule and your obligations. Otherwise, you're going to get spoken for, and you might not like how that comes down. Additionally, you may want to consider addressing change orders. It's hard enough to get paid for the work that we do in this line of work, and change orders only make it infinitely worse. So you may want to consider requiring that you have written authorization from your employer before proceeding with any additional work. And additionally, that that written authorization constitutes an obligation from your employer to pay you in a timely fashion for the work that's performed, and that it is not tied to any refund or reimbursement they receive from the owner. You see, terms and conditions are your chance and opportunity to address some big issues. And I highly suggest that you do. Welcome back. And next, we're going to take a look at your most detailed section of your proposal, which is your scope of work. And we're going to discuss how to assess what that includes and how to write that out. The most important step to being ready to pull this together is having performed your Mizen Plus. That detailed and preliminary review of the project documents is going to give you a comprehensive understanding of what the project entails and what it requires so that you can write that out within your proposal. The knowledge that you gain and the notes that you make along the way are in large part in preparation for drafting your scope of work. And this step of preparation not only allows for your takeoffs to be both quick and accurate, but it also makes it possible for you to draft this section, your scope of work, which is sometimes referred to as a scope letter, 
well in advance of your actual bid submission. And this is important because you want to get this information in the hands of general contractors as early as possible. By doing so, you're giving them the information and opportunity to determine if they have any scope gaps that they need to address or have closed on bid day. By helping them with this, it certainly doesn't hurt your chances of being awarded your project. And additionally, it's going to demonstrate proactivity on your behalf, which again will go a long ways for you in the industry. And the cool part about earning all these brownie points is you needn't even concern them with price until bid day. And what we haven't yet discussed is that your scope of work is going to be two parts of equal importance. You're going to be telling them what it is you are doing and explicitly what you're not doing within the project. So let's take a look at how that might look for you. And what you see here is an example plan set that I've prepared for our review today. And I'm going to go through and show you the highlights and notes that I make and how I include that into my scope of work. And one of the first ones I always keep a close look out for are the code requirements on the job. And early on, I can see here that the 2019 California Building Code, or CBST, has jurisdiction on the construction of this project. Furthermore, under structural steel, I see that the AISC specifications and code of standard practices, as well as the AWS specifications, apply to the steel construction and welding on this job. So I'm going to make notes of those and more when I'm putting together my scope of work. Now for the items that I intend to provide on this project, I always highlight or identify them in some way that's going to capture my attention, but sometimes I have to make additional notes to either information that I'm not aware of or different construction methods that I'm intending based on how I bid the job. And see one here, at grid lines B16, there's a steel column shown on the foundation plan, but there's no material size provided for it. So I made the note here that I assumed the material size of this column to be similar to those in the surrounding area. And again, this happens down here on grid lines J20. There's another steel column shown with no material size provided, so I made a note that I assume the material size of this column to be similar to that in the surrounding area of this stairwell. Now, as we've discussed, <clears throat> your scope of work is going to be two parts of equal importance. It's not just about what you are doing, but also what you're not going to be doing on the job. And I want to give you an example of that here. So on this roof plan, this has a detail call out for a detail 20 on sheet S7.2. And I have a red line stricken through this call out, which means that I don't have anything included to pick up on this detail, but it doesn't mean I don't have anything at all to say on it. If I look at this detail, this shows a wood brace to the parapet at the high roof of this building. And this brace has steel angles for the anchors at either end. And I have these clouded and excluded, meaning that I'm not going to be providing these on the job. And so when I go to draft my scope of work, I'm going to state that I am not going to be providing these steel angles. And I'm also going to be telling them why it is that I don't intend to do so. Now let's take a look at actually writing this out. Now it's best practice and I highly recommend that you include an itemized list of the contract documents that you reviewed when developing your scope of work, including all of the codes and specifications. And if there's a project manual, all the spec sections that applied to your scope of work should be listed here. Additionally, any addendas that were published and also the design team and their plan sets and dates should be provided on your scope of work. In the event that there are future revisions to any of this information, by having this detailed information provided here, you're negating being held to your previous bid price on new information that could certainly impact your cost to do the project. And following this, I recommend an itemized list of the materials and products that you do intend to provide on the project. And it's here that you can provide notes or information that could really set you apart from the competition. For example, in my items one and three, I bring up the fact that the steel columns of those locations were missing material sizes. But I identified that and I accounted for it by assuming that they were the same size as the other steel columns in their surrounding areas. Providing information such as this is helpful to the general contractors also bidding the project and it also shows a detail on your behalf that could help you win the job. And in my inclusions list, I like to provide the details that pertain to each item within my inclusions and scope of work. So that if I'm going over this information in an interview with a general contractor or doing a job transfer with project management team down the road, we can follow this information and they can see where I obtained and ascertained this information that applies to each individual part of our scope of work that I picked up. 
Additionally, I like to break out my structural steel inclusions list from the ones of the miscellaneous steel items. These different sets are often found in different plan sets, and it makes your scope of work look cleaner breaking them out individually as well. But last and not least, it's important that you tell them what it is you're not going to be doing on the job, which is your exclusions list. Now, your company might have and probably does have standard exclusions, which are things that they just will not do because it's not your forte. But there's obviously going to be job-specific exclusions, and that's what I want to cover with you here and now. Now, I gave you the example of one of them so that we could see this on here. I have many more that apply to the whole rest of the job, but I do have that all required three three quarter inch angle anchors for the wood parapet braces on details and here's 20 on 7.2 that we looked at and my reasoning for this is that the wood framing contractor should furnish and install these as they're providing those braces so each one of these i have specifically excluded and even my reasoning why some of those are lacking information some of those it's more appropriate that another performing contractor provide that but what's most important is that i told the general contractor that they won't be receiving it from us so they can account for this when they're bidding their job that someone else needs to provide that for them. And last but not least, we're going to talk about price. Often the first, but hopefully not the only part of your proposal that your customer or contractor looks at. Now commonly, price is delivered as a single lump sum number, but some people prefer a more detailed breakout. So I say to each his own. Additionally, some projects might have add alternate requests on them, which are portions of work that cost pending the owner might have added or subtracted to your contract. But in any event, I want to remind you that the price on your proposal should include your markup and all applicable taxes. Make sure that it's clear, legible, right up front, and priced right to get you the work. Thanks for tuning in today. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to give it a thumbs up and then check out our website where you can subscribe to receive videos like this every single week, bringing you only the best in steel construction education. And while you're there, be sure to check out our list of courses, providing you a deeper and more intensive study on topics just like this one. You see here at the SBC Group, it's our mission to help you know the most so that you can do your best. And finally, if you should have any questions or concerns about where you're going to spend eternity and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be glad to help you with that too. Thank you and God bless.